Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about the central limit theorem. What is the central limit theorem, you at? Did you switch to another tab? Hey. Hey, come back. Don't, no, no, don't do other things. This is important. Are you texting? No, no, no. We're focusing. Okay. Now that everybody's back, what is the central limit theorem? So, the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is what makes the normal distribution so important to study. While it may not be uncommon that we have data that is normally distributed, and that means that we need to use the normal distribution to study it, the normal distribution is way more useful than just for those cases. And that's because of the central limit theorem. So what does the central limit theorem say? Consider a random variable x. And x is a, is a random variable and it has a mean of mu sub x and a standard deviation of sigma. Now, x can be normally distributed, it could be uniformly distributed, it could be distributed however we want. It just, it has a mean and it has a standard deviation. What the central limit theorem says is that if we're, if we take a sample from x and calculate that mean, and then take another sample from x and calculate the mean of that sample, and calculate another sample and mean and keep doing this, the distribution of those sample means is normal. So let's let x bar be the distribution of the sample means. Then it is normal with a mean of mu x and a standard deviation not of sigma x, but of sigma sub x divided by the square root of n, where n is equal to uh, our sample size. So if we're gonna take samples of 10 over and over and over again, then n is 10. If we're gonna take samples of 50 over and over and over again, then n is 50. And what this says is that if we're gonna calculate the distribution of those means, then they're gonna be centered around the actual mean of x, which makes sense. Um, if that's the expected value of x, then we would expect to get sample means about that value. But the standard deviation changes with sample size. And what that's telling us is that our standard deviation is getting smaller the larger that we make our repeated samples. And what that means is that if you remember, when we decreased our standard deviation, our sample became, our normal distribution became skinnier but taller. So that means that the larger our sample size, the less variability we have in our sample means. And this is gonna be really important in the future whenever we try to determine how accurate a sample is to the distribution it's coming from. But to get a better idea of what the central limit theorem is telling us, let's look at some pictures. All right, so to recap, we have a random variable x that has a mean of mu of x and a standard deviation of sigma of x. And we said that if we repeatedly sample from that, regardless of whether or not that original random variable is normal or not, the distribution of those sample means is going to be normal. And it's gonna be normal with a mean of mu of x and a standard deviation of sigma x over square root n. Um, and so as a general rule of thumb, if x is normally distributed, um, then this kind of generally always works. 
um, but if X is not normally distributed, then you really want to have sample sizes of at least 30. Um, the more not normal X is, the higher that number would probably be. So in general, the bigger the sample sizes, the better. Now, uh, I want to look at some pictures here. So what I have here is I've just defined a generic uh, PDF. Um, and so the graph of that PDF is given here. Um, it's definitely not a normal, right? Remember, a normal would be bell curved. Um, and so this is, the, this is the distribution for our x. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to randomly sample from that distribution a thousand times. Um, and I get this histogram. And we can see that like it's not perfect, right? Anytime you sample, there's going to be some variability in there. But it kind of looks like the shape of the original distribution, right? Um, and so it's, it's also definitely not normal. All right, so what do we do next? So rather than going through and sampling one point from that distribution a thousand times, uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and uh, for a thousand different times, I'm going to go through and I'm going to sample two points from that distribution, calculate their mean, and plot those um, on a histogram. And whenever I do that, I get this shape. So here we are, we've just moved from picking sample points one at a time to picking two at a time and taking their mean. And already, like, this looks less like the original distribution, and it's starting to look more like um, a normal. But what happens if we increase the number of points that we sample? So instead of taking two and taking their mean, let's take, let's take five. So if we go over here and we say, I want to take five at a time. And we edit out the technical difficulties that we encountered. Um, at five at a time, we're already seeing something that looks more normal. Right? So again, let's stop and remember what it is that we're doing. Right? We have a distribution that looks like this, right? And it's hard for us to work with this, if, especially if we don't know exactly what that shape is. And if we just took a random sample from that shape, we would just get something that, that looks like that shape. And again, that doesn't give us anything to work with. But if instead we start doing repeated samples, and looking at the distribution of the mean of those samples, it starts to look more and more like a normal. So let's bump this up to 10 per sample. And we have something that looks rather normal. Now, let's say that we've done this, and now this looks like a normal. What, how does that help us? If you remember when we talked about the normal distribution, we talked about z-scores and looking at probabilities based off of standard normals. And we can do that for any distribution that's normal. So what this allows us to do is to take a random variable that's not normal, which we can't use a standard normal chart on. But if we look at the distribution of the sample means, that becomes normal that we can use z-scores and a standard normal chart and those probabilities on. And so I can ask questions like if x bar is a sample mean, then what is the probability that that sample mean is uh, greater than, uh, let's say, uh, 0 0.7. Now, to answer that question, I get to use the fact that I know that x bar 
is distributed like a normal, which means that I can get a z-score by taking z is equal to x bar um, minus uh, sigma of x or minus <clears throat> mu of x divided by sigma of x over square root n. And I can calculate that z-score and I can use a standard normal chart to answer that question.